And the message I'm going to share is a, is a little different. I, I, I had another message I wanted to do, but for some reason I just felt like the Lord kept bringing me back to this passage. So it must be for me and maybe someone, someone else. We'll see, right? Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of gathering together in the name of Jesus for all that he is and does in our lives. And Lord, for the fact that you've called us and you've redeemed us. And Lord, you continue to lead us and guide us. And we thank you for the privilege of being your children. And just ask you to speak to us through your word that it would find good soil in which it could bear much fruit. And Lord, just thank you for today. None of us know what tomorrow holds, but here we are. And we're in your in your word today, and we ask that out of it would come life and fruit, and help us, Lord, to respond in a way that you've called us to. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Grab a seat if you would. Hebrews chapter 12, and before we get started, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, God, God is known to us personally and scripturally as our Heavenly Father. Jesus said, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. And we're all known as his sons and daughters, as believers in Christ. And a loving Father has given us a path to follow, a way to live, a truth to believe, and a life that is eternal. He's given us the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? I mean, it's an amazing thing what he's done for us. But the question I want to ask is, how do you know if your experience is real? How can you tell if your faith is solid and sure? Or, or I could ask the individual question, how, how genuine is your experience? Is it real? Some people say, well, I'm forgiven, I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven. And the Bible places a lot of emphasis on the individual being saved, but it places a lot more emphasis on the one who does the saving. In fact, this whole book is about the one who does the saving, right? It's all about the Lord. It's all about his son. Our Father who sent His only Son runs the best family in the universe. He's an amazing dad, a great father. And look what it says here in chapter 12. I'm just going to start in verse 3. Consider Him. In fact, this morning, as Neil said, we're going to consider Him by taking communion. And as Jesus said it, remember me. So consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become discouraged in your souls. You've not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons or daughters. My son, my daughter, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there who a father doesn't chasten? But if you are without chastening, which we've all become partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had a human father who corrected us and we paid them respect, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days, those earthly fathers chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If you can live 
however you want and not be disciplined or corrected. And you might not be a child, he says. You might not be a son or daughter. I'm not sure the language could be plainer. And, and I know for myself, I would rather get my discipline, my correction on this side of heaven and still the other side. Some people may think or might say, well, I live as I please. I partake in all earthly pleasures. I hang out with sh different shades of culture. And I still have a good job. I'm healthy. I go to church. I'm doing all right. John, this sounds like a beat the sheep message. Where are we going with this? Scare the flock to walk the line? Is that what we're doing? Well, let me just say this from the beginning of time, if you go all the way back to Genesis. God, a loving father, and you know this, he set boundaries for the first people on earth. He said, you can have all this and this and this, but don't touch that. If you do, you'll die. That was pretty clear in the book of Genesis, wasn't it? He said, I, I, I've given you all of this, but I'm going to set some boundaries for your good. Uh, and there's consequences if you don't obey. And then the enemy came along and said to Eve, oh, you know, that, that, that's not really true. That's not going to hurt you. In fact, it'll open up life in a way that'll be more enjoyable. You'll be wise. You'll be like God. And so they crossed the boundary that the father told them not to cross. And they ended up guilty, afraid, and hiding from God. In Genesis chapter 2, we know the verse that says, The Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't go there. For that's not for you. For in the day that you eat of it, there'll be some bad consequences. You'll surely die. So God gives boundaries. You're aware of that, right? That God has boundaries. And they're, they're all through Scripture for those who are his children. You know, one of them he gives is sex outside of marriage. God says, not for you if you're my child. You, you know that, right? Those aren't my boundaries. Those are his. God gives boundaries like he says certain people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he gives a strong list. Drunkards, revilers, homosexuals. These are God's boundaries for, for you and I. He, he, he says adultery. Uh-uh, don't go there. There's consequences. Stealing, lying, gossip, murder. You say, hey, wait a minute. I, I live my life. I blow it. I do things I know are wrong, but, but I still got a good job. I, I have a garden in my yard. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm good. I've got money in the bank. But let me ask this question. Maybe that's true, but what's going on on the inside? People look on the outside of you and I. But inwardly, here's the deal. We know what's going on inside of us. And all the debate in the world doesn't change that. And the good and the obedient, well, they may suffer loss. Things go wrong. Lose a job, have an automobile accident, sickness. Not necessarily is that God's chastening or judgment. I mean, read the book of Job. He went through all kinds of things, and they were temporary. The, the big loss of disobedience, of crossing those boundaries, is your relationship, your communion with Christ, your daily walk your heart for him and with him. And, and see, here's the thing. A lot of people live in marriages like that. You say, how do you know? I've been a pastor for 40 years. I've talked to lots of couples and married people. There's a shadow or a valley sometimes that comes between the husband and the wife. Outwardly, you might never know. They seem normal as usual. But the kindness between one another is gone. The sweetness. 
There, there's a hardness and uneasiness in the relationship. It, it's actually, I believe, almost worse than divorce. And it gets colder by the minute. And if you're his child, when you walk in disobedience, you lose your peace. The peace of your mind and your heart. And, and you live with a sense of guilt and condemnation. And, and it affects even your sleep at times. You're about as happy as Jonah in the belly of a fish. Jonah was walking in complete disobedience. And remember what he said? He said, I, I cried out of the belly of Sheol. That word in Hebrew means hell. He said, in my disobedience, I felt like I was in hell. Not much you can say in favor of disobedience. One of the biggest losses, and, and you may be there, I don't know, is the loss of a prayer life. When, when you walk in that kind of objection to what God has set in your life as boundaries, pretty soon you just don't pray anymore. It's just not there. That great time of intimacy and closeness with him, it, it stops. Oh, you, you might pray over dinner or meal, but, but I mean really opening your heart and life to him because you're not really willing to listen to him. Oh, you may sit in church and listen, but continue to walk in disobedience. Might as well be sitting in Taco Bell. When there isn't any communication, it's all, it's all very empty. And the problem is you know it whether others do or not that there's something not right, and it doesn't go away. Like in that marriage, a dead marriage, it's everywhere you go. It's in the kitchen, it's in the den, it's in the car, it's in the bedroom. Outwardly, it may look good, but inwardly, it's frigid and very, very lonely. And someone said when it comes to disobedience, that you can't reach for the stars and garbage at the same time. It's just not possible. No twisting of theology or, or the Bible can bring things back to the way they were. Well, I'll just adjust the way the Bible speaks. David lived with his disobedience. The loss of intimacy with the Lord, we all know his story. And he cried out in Psalm 19. This is what he said. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, let me come back into that relationship. <clears throat> now, let's go back in chapter 12 to verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. John, that's a bummer. I know. But just because you're going through a tough time doesn't mean you're disciplined or being corrected. I mean, think about Jesus when he said to his disciples, get in the boat, go to the other side. And when they tried to do that, they hit this massive storm. They were right in the middle of being obedient. But they were also right in the middle of a storm because they did exactly what God told them to do. So I don't know, you don't know what's going on in someone's life if they're going through a difficult time, a hurtful time, a, a stressful time. You, you don't have the opportunity to judge them or criticize, oh, they must be way outside of God's will. The fruit of the Spirit, it says, is love and joy and peace. And then the next thing is long-suffering. Who put those two words together? <laughs> Long and suffering? The, the, this word in the book of Hebrews, this word chasten, I, I, I kind of did a word study on it. And it doesn't really contain the idea of punishment. Please listen. It's more like discipline, like an athlete. It's more like training. The Lord causes those who are his children to be, to be strengthened, to be trained, to be mentored, to be educated, to, to be instructed. 
And what he's saying is, my son or daughter, don't get uptight or angry or mad as I'm strengthening you and, 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 and challenging you and growing you. He brings strength. He, he, he brings rebuke. And, and the word rebuke, listen to what it says. My, my son, do not despise the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Has this, have you ever read this? Has it ever rebuked you? It has me many times. It says, don't be discouraged when that occurs. And, and we've all been there. The Lord convicts, and sometimes he'll slow us down just to deal with us. And it's an evidence that he loves us, not that he's out to get us. God gives his spirit his, his, to those who obey him. You know, we used to sing a song a long time ago. Maybe you remember it. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Remember Samson? What was with Samson? He had this beautiful woman. I, I'm, she must have been beautiful because she, she lied to him over and over again. He still hung with her. And then finally she said, come on, Samson, tell me the truth. And what, where do you get your strength from? So he finally told her the truth. Remember that? And she cut off his hair. And in Judges chapter 16, 20, after she did, we, we have this. And she said, the Philistines are upon you. So he woke from his sleep and said, I'll go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. Why? He was disobedient. Someone once said, it's not easy to live with a cheater or a liar or a thief, especially if that cheater, liar, or thief is you. Very difficult. And we have forgotten the exhortation, he says, that speaks to you as a son or a daughter. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, now scourges has the idea of like a stick or a switch. Anyone ever, if you grew up, in the era I grew up in, you're very familiar with the stick or a switch. <laughs> and perhaps a belt. I'll never forget one time, and I won't be descriptive with this, but I have a younger sister. And we were out in the backyard. We were, I was probably 11. She was probably 9. And we were just walking around the backyard, and I told my sister, I said, you know, Jane, if you look up like this and hold your hands like this, we, didn't, we weren't churched or anything. I said, and you, you stand there and walk straight towards me. I can somehow, just by thinking, stop you in your tracks. She's, what? I didn't know my mom and dad were on the screen porch watching. But, but I, I said, now you've got to walk straight towards me. And she didn't know that a dog had deposited some stuff in the backyard. <laughs> I know. Well, there was a, a bunch of bamboo along the side of the yard. And when she stumbled into the doggy stuff, my dad came off the back porch, cut himself a little piece of bamboo. And I was dancing around the backyard for a while. I got a scourging. In Proverbs the book of Proverbs, you know there's 13 verses on child raising. Twelve of them say, use the rod and you'll save your son or daughter from Hades and make them wise. I remember one time Chuck Smith was speaking on that passage where he said, spare the rod and spoil the child. And he said, his grandson turned the verse upside down and said, spare the rod. Spoil the child. <laughs> and Chuck said, I'm not sure that's exactly what that scripture means. And you'll save your son from Hades and make him wise. 
My dad wasn't a Christian, but I'll say this. He was very biblical when it came to the rod. The idea is God loves his children, and he disciplines them. He corrects them. I have, I have three grown kids now. And all of them, I have to say, were different when it came to discipline. Some were harder than others, more difficult to correct. In fact, some of them were absolute opposite of one another. And then the third one was even more opposite than them. And I didn't know opposite could go in three directions, but it can. <laughs> and, and, and with child rearing, which is one of the hardest jobs you'll ever have, you don't discipline or spank your kids because they do crazy things. Kids are crazy. How many of you know kids? I mean, you were a kid, right? Were you not crazy? Kids are crazy. You discipline kids because of disobedience, not because they're kids. There's a difference, and we're all different. See, I, I believe that the biggest scourging you can experience in, in life is a wasted life. Salvation comes to you, and it's not just a ticket to heaven. One of the greatest things that comes to you is that you experience his grace, his forgiveness, but also you step into a life of purpose. Man, I've got a purpose in my life now. I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ. There are certain things that he wants me to accomplish. He has a plan for my life. I don't just drift around from thing to thing. I've got him now leading and guiding, walking in his wisdom and his peace. And it's an awesome thing. The worst thing would to live a life that's barren and fruitless. And the Lord say, I, I, I had a plan for your life, and instead you chose to disobey. That, that your life would end, and it would have no impact for the kingdom. Can you imagine? That, that your heart was never burdened for a single lost person when, when Jesus came and gave his very life for that reason. There is rebuke from the Lord. Peter knew it. David experienced it. And thank God he corrects us and challenges us and mentors us and forgives us. Amen? I mean, where would we be without that? No Christian can just live as he pleases. You're under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's called Lord. He's the one in charge. It says in our, in our text, if you're without chastening of which all have become partakers, then you're an illegitimate. You're not a son. If God doesn't deal with you or correct you, well, he says you're probably not a real believer. And he makes a comparison between an earthly and a heavenly. Furthermore, we had human fathers who corrected us. We paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? We have an earthly father, and we have a heavenly father. And as an earthly father, I have certain, especially when my kids were growing up, I had certain responsibilities and obligations as a dad. Not to be their best buddy, although I enjoyed being buddies with my kids, but I had a responsibility to feed them, provide a roof over their head, to expose them to God's word and his love. To know what's going on in their life. I, I, I wanted to know who their friends were and what they were up to. To sow into their life. To, to deal with all the craziness and, and, and disobedience and things. And, and, and try to be a responsible dad. But I couldn't save them. I couldn't change their hearts. I couldn't forgive their sins. I, I was an earthly father, but we also have a heavenly father. It tells us in verse 10, For they indeed for a few days, earthly fathers, chastened us, 
And, and I remember dealing with my kids. I don't, anybody here have perfect kids? Oh, you're like me. So you had at times to discipline them, instruct them, right? I'll never forget one time one of my kids would, kept breaking curfew. We had a curfew. We had to be home at a certain time. Especially on Saturday night because I had to speak on Sunday. And we had one child, I won't mention his or her name. Because all three of them go to church here. This one would always start breaking curfew. Especially on Saturday night. And I'd be up late. Curfew back then was, well, I thought it was generous. It was midnight. What goes on good after midnight? Not a whole lot. So this, this person would get home after midnight, and I would be up waiting. And we would get into an interesting dialogue. <laughs> and some harsh words were mentioned at times. And I remember saying one time, the only reason you're saying that to me is because I love you. Otherwise, I'd be in there sleeping. I got to speak tomorrow morning. I got to be up early. And I'm here waiting for you because I care about you. And the only reason that God instructs and trains and disciplines and deals with things in our life is because he loves you. He, he doesn't want you to, to waste your life. And, and it says here in verse 10, for indeed a few days chastened us seem best to them, but he... For our prophet, that we may be partakers of his holiness. That he, he does it so that we might be able to experience a spiritual life. One that's truly satisfying and lasts forever. Uh, that we would be able to walk in his grace and his forgiveness. And, 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 and know what it's like to have purpose in life. And, and to walk in the way and the truth. And here's the deal. He's not going to give up on you. He's going to keep coming back around. That's why it says, no chastening in verse 11 seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, it will yield peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. When God's dealing with you, the end result is righteousness that includes peace. Peace with God. Peace with yourself. When we live as he called us to live and he designed us to live, there's a peace that comes from the Lord. And we find ourselves being, being trained by him. We find ourselves being forgiven by him and disciplined by him. See, God has to teach us some things. Some people, he needs to teach how to forgive. They're hard-hearted and don't know how to let go of something that happened to them. God has to teach that person how to forgive. I remember, I, maybe you've heard me tell my story many times that, you know, I had a dad who was not a, he was, he was, he was abusive. God had to teach me to forgive him. And I came to a place in my life where the Lord said, John, your dad is not the enemy. He's a victim of the enemy and you'd be just like him had I not saved you. I thought, Lord, you're right. Some he has to teach how to put away lustful thoughts and lifestyles. And God has a way of exposing and, and dealing with hearts like that. So, some people he's trying to teach them how to, how to walk away from drugs and alcohol and drunkenness. Some people he, he's teaching how to stop being so self-righteous and critical with their attitudes. God is teaching us and training us and conforming us into the image of Christ. See, on the cross, you, you know this. Jesus said it is finished. The price for salvation has been completely paid. But I would submit to you, he's not finished with you or me yet. Oh, he, he's finished with the process of dying for our sins. But he's not finished with conforming you and I into his image, is he? Amen. No, it, it's still going on and on. Sometimes it takes some discipline. Sometimes it takes some mentoring, some rebuke, some correction. We have his word. We have his spirit. And Jesus, our Savior, intercedes for us. God loves us enough to continue this work in us, to correct us, to cause us to grow, and to bear fruit. And he says, if this isn't going on in your life, well, then you might not be his child. 
It doesn't seem great while it's going on, but it produces fruit and produces peace. Listen to what he says again. For consider him who endeared such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged. And so, so, so today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to consider him who gave his life for you and I, laid down his life, not a sinner, but we are. And he gave himself. Amazing picture of love. He gave his life so we could live a changed life, a forgiven life, a new life, a life with a heavenly father who, who guides us, who corrects us, who mentors us, who rebuilds us, who instructs us because he loves us. It's not just having a destiny in heaven. He wants you and I to have a life that has purpose and passion and direction from him. He wants us to, to follow him. He, he, he's the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, now, when you take communion, I want you to do this in remembrance of me, what I've done for you, yes, but also what I've called you to do. Let, let's, let's don't forget that you and I are here on this earth because God has a purpose for our life, a calling on your life. Something that he wants to equip you to do. God, God wants you to have a, a heart for those who are lost. For those who don't know him. We, we have this amazing heavenly father. You know, when, when Jesus, after he had been crucified and rose from the dead, he said, now, you guys, it's not over. Go into all the world and tell people about me what I've done for you, and what I can do for them. And I would submit to you that there is not a, not a, not a more needful time than the time we live in today, that people need his peace, his joy, his strength, his life, his way, his truth, than right now. Have you ever lived in a crazier time? I mean, not to mention the storms, the wars, the politics. You know, I, my, my wife came in for second service. She said, well, I didn't see, I didn't see the, the service online. I said, oh, well, so I asked Neil. I said, Neil, are we not online? He said, well, Facebook kicked us off. I go, what? Yeah, you said something about politics. What? It's my fault? <laughs> but for some reason, we're not meeting their guidelines anymore. I think it's your fault. No, it's not. I don't know what those guidelines are, but that's interesting, isn't it? We're being chastised by Facebook. <laughs> I think we can take it. A life with a heavenly father who guides and corrects and mentors and rebukes and instructs. You know, if you have a parent that doesn't guide and instruct, and correct, and mentor, and rebuild? Do they really care about you? Doesn't seem like it, does it? Well, he does. He loves us, and our destiny is not just heaven, but once again, being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And, and one day we'll see him face to face. And all of us here, I think, who are true believers want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You disobeyed me every day. <laughs> and I kept having to correct you. No, you learned the lessons along the way. And I shaped and fashioned you into my image. Well done. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we're going after. And may the Lord continue to work in our lives in a way with his grace and mercy, his correction, his discipline, his mentoring, his rebuilding, all the things he needs to do to help us to become all that he's called us to be. So the apostle Paul would say, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord hates, he chastens. No, whom the Lord loves. He chastens.